It's great to be back in Tennessee. Um, I am on the, in the middle of, uh, middle of a book tour. Uh-oh, that's Red Bull. Um, <laughs> I, I'm in the middle of a book tour. Uh, this is, uh, I think, the seventh or eighth stop, so I'm a little bit exhausted. And uh, they, they, I think they saw it in my eyes and, and uh, procured one of my favorite beverages, uh, Red Bull. Um, it's great to be back home in, in Tennessee. I was just in Memphis a few days ago. Uh, I was also in Oxford, Mississippi, and Jackson. Uh, so hitting the, the deep south first uh, with this notion that this book might be sort of a literary air conditioning, you know, that might <laughs> cool people off a little bit. Um, I hope so. Um, the, uh, I'm going to talk a little tonight about how I got into this story and some of the travels that uh, were part of the research for In the Kingdom of Ice. Um, let's see. How are we doing? The Jeanette expedition um, in its day, in the 1880s, was extremely well known. It was a sensation. It was the subject of best-selling books. It was the subject of uh, uh, memorials and plays and poems and uh, songs. It was the subject of a naval inquiry, a congressional inquiry, uh, parades in Manhattan uh, when the survivors came home. Uh, it was extremely well known, and yet today I think if you polled 100 people, you'd probably find one or two who've even, even heard of it. Um, and so when I, when I found out about it when, when I was on an assignment for National Geographic magazine to write about um, a, a Norwegian explorer named Fridtjof Nansen, um, who was obsessed with the Jeanette expedition, uh, I had never heard of this Jeanette thing, and I filed it away and thought, you know, this, this sounds like something big and something that has for whatever combination of reasons, been completely forgotten. And uh, so uh, it got me on this, uh, what proved to be a four-year journey um, that led me around the world and got me into the story of the Jeanette. This is the commander of the USS Jeanette, George Washington DeLong, who becomes the main character of the story. Uh, his, his journals uh, were best-selling books in their day. Uh, it uh, is the subject, the whole voyage is the subject of a of a well-known memorial uh, on the grounds of the Naval Academy in Annapolis. And uh, monuments are scattered around the country. Uh, but again, like I say, just completely forgotten. Uh, so the atmosphere in which the voyage was, uh, was hatched, uh, to sort of understand this, uh, you have to go way back. Um, there was... Uh, a notion that went back to the Vikings and the Greeks and some of the early maps, including this uh, map from the 1590s, uh, a Mercator map, um, that there was at the top of the world um, an open polar sea, uh, a warm water, a warm uh, body of water that um, uh, could somehow, if you could somehow get there, you could sail, literally sail to the North Pole. Uh, once you get a, a, something like this fixed to a map, it becomes very difficult to dislodge it from public imagination. And, um, and so the idea persisted for centuries. Uh, there was also an idea called Ultima Thule, that the, the Scandinavians believed in this concept, uh, that there was a warm place with uh, some sort of tropical uh, marine life. Uh, if you could just get beyond the ice, you would find this oasis at the top of the world. The Greeks, the Greeks talked about um, Hyperborea, let's see if that's in here. Hyperborea, which was another idea of kind of a warm, a warm place somewhere beyond the mountains, if you could just somehow reach it. The idea uh, led later in, in the middle 18, 1800s to this concept of holes at the poles. It was a popular concept uh, started by a completely wacky guy who was a lecture person, a, a guy from uh, Ohio named John Cleve Sims, who said that there was holes at both the North and the South Pole, and uh, there were people living down there if we could just get to them. Um, this is a uh, rendering, an artist rendering from um, Harper's Magazine, uh, which shows uh, this idea. The concept kind of kept on going for a while, and uh, even to this day, you can find it. Um, you can find it in um, on websites. It's sort of a conspiracy theory now. The holes at the poles, folks. Who, I mean, these folks say, you know, that this is the explanation behind UFOs, and uh, 
that there's still people down there and the government has tried to, to cover it up. It's, you know, Obama's tried to prevent us from knowing about them. Uh, rather entertaining, but um, this concept of some sort of place down there uh, or up there um, uh, got greater popularity with this guy, Jules Verne, uh, and the publication of his novel, Journey to the Center of the Earth, where he, he took off with this idea and uh, changed it a little bit. The idea was that it was a subterranean sea, uh, which he called the, uh, the Central Sea. And uh, the idea was, um, you know, that, uh, that if we could just somehow find these vents that led into these cavities of the Earth, um, there would be this whole other civilization down there. Of course, other people are supposed to be at the North Pole. <laughs> uh, I thought this was an ancient idea, going back millennia or something like that, but uh, or at least you know centuries and centuries. Um, and in fact, um, it started with the Thomas Nast ca cartoon from the 1860s, uh, which depicted Santa Claus living at the North Pole. Uh, but it spoke to our need somehow to believe that there was this sort of warm, happy, jolly place up there um, if we could just reach it. Um, so during the uh, 1850s and 60s, um, the concept of an open polar sea kind of reached its uh, highest state, I, I guess you'd say, with the, the ideas and the beliefs of this man, who is Dr. August Peterman, a, uh, a German doctor uh, and a German uh, cartographer who was the maker of the best maps in the world at that time. He also had, like so many of the people in my, in my book, um, he had excellent facial hair. <laughs> he produced these beautiful maps, these hand-colored maps that were up to date. They were sort of the Google maps of their day. They showed every little detail. And maps were very important and very powerful tools then uh, for exploration. And exploration in turn fueled his maps. Because when an explorer went somewhere, the first thing he did when he got back was go to Gotha, Germany, and meet with him. And these details from the field notes were incorporated into the newest maps. Um, so uh, when he had ideas about something like the Arctic, uh, people listened to him. He was enormously influential, uh, August Peterman. So this begins to show uh, the, the, the evolution of this idea of an open polar sea. Uh, at this time, there was a knowledge of um, uh, of the Gulf Stream and how powerful it was in bringing uh, you know, thermal currents from the uh, tropics north, and they didn't know exactly where it went, past Norway somewhere. The, the leading concept was that it tunneled under the ice of the Arctic and that a, a corresponding current on the Pacific side, called the Kuro Siwo, also went north, swept north past Japan, up past Russia, through the Bering Strait and tunneled under the ice, and that these two great currents converged at the North Pole, thus creating the Open Polar Sea. And see, it's kind of a backwards idea that um, this thing that no one has seen, we have to prove that it exists and why it exists, even before we've you know, proven that it, it uh, actually doesn't exist. Uh, this, this, shows, this shows a little bit more um, the way it was supposed to work. I know right now, to us, it seems completely crazy. Um, but this was some of the leading science of the day and certainly some of the more popular science of the day. And um, many people, unfortunately, in Arctic exploration have to suffer mightily or even die to, to prove or disprove uh, some of these concepts. Somebody who was fascinated by August Peterman and fascinated by um, the open polar sea concept was this guy. Uh, who also had pretty good facial hair. Um, this is the uh, third richest man in New York, uh, the publisher, Playboy publisher of the New York Herald, uh, which was then the largest circulation newspaper in the world. Uh, he was a, an outlandish, um, gilded age character who had um, sent Stanley to find Livingston in Africa and created other spectacles to generate more newspaper sales. Um, this was his paper, the New York Herald. 
he was a dualist. He was a, a womanizer, a guy with multiple yachts uh, who lived uh, overseas most of the time. Um, he was also a sportsman. Uh, he was the first, uh, the winner of the first transatlantic yacht race. Uh, so he was a guy into all kinds of uh, adventure and, and, and cer certainly spectacle. And, um, and uh, he was also really fascinated by, had a fetish for owls. And uh, this was the New York Herald office, the top of uh, the parapets there you'll see owls everywhere. And he had live owls at his house. He, he had stuffed owls, owls on his masthead, owls on his cufflinks. Uh, some people have suggested that Gordon Bennett was the model for Batman. Um, a, a mysterious, elusive bachelor, uh, extremely wealthy millionaire who had a fetish for night, uh, night flying creatures. This is um, a caricature of, of Bennett later in life in the pages of, um, Condina, of, of Vanity Fair. Uh, this is one of his many yachts, the Lysistrata, um, which had, among other amenities, two padded cells, uh, padded rooms, where he kept his dairy cows so he could have fresh cream every morning for breakfast. <laughs> Um, this is one of Gordon Bennett's yachts, uh, kind of showing life uh, aboard. This is a pretty famous painting from the Gilded Age. He was really interested in, in competitive sports, and he brought tennis, uh, competitive tennis, to the United States, to this place that he built in Newport called the Newport Casino. Um, and it's now the uh, National Tennis Hall of Fame. When uh, later, after my expedition, uh, after my, the story of my book, uh, he got into uh, auto, automobile racing and uh, created something called the Gordon Bennett Cup. Also balloon racing, um, very into this stuff. This uh, balloon race, the Bo Gordon Bennett Cup, um, exists to this day. So he'd, he had sent this guy, Stanley, to find Livingston in Africa, even though uh, Livingston uh, wasn't exactly lost and uh, <laughs> He didn't really need to be found, but um, Bennett thought it would be a great newspaper spectacle and it would sell papers, and that along the way uh, a lot of new stuff would be learned and um, maps would change and uh, uh, an understanding of the continent, continent would emerge, which it did. Uh, it was an enormous success. Um, this, is some, this is one of the clippings from one of his many dispatches in the, uh, in the Herald. So knowing that this was such a success, Bennett decided that it was time to come up with something even bigger. And so he decided to underwrite a voyage to the North Pole with this man, George Washington DeLong, as his, uh, as his captain. He purchased uh, a vessel, which became the USS Jeanette. It was sailed around the Horn to San Francisco, massively reinforced for the ice, and um, this became really a, a national endeavor because it, al it also became a Navy expedition. Kind of a weird hybrid. You wouldn't really have this today where an eccentric millionaire publisher joins forces with the U.S. Navy uh, to create a, uh, an expedition. But that's the way it worked. The Navy of that day was quite um, weak and, and uh, quite in its infancy. So this was this sort of unique hybrid of, of business and, uh, and government. On board the ship were all the latest inventions, including Edison's lights, which he had just been tinkering with and trying to perfect, uh, telephones from Alexander Graham Bell, telegraph equipment so that they could have communications over the ice, and um, uh, all kinds of other stuff, including uh, an organ, uh, lots of entertainments. They knew they were going to be stuck in the ice a long time, uh, that they would eventually find this open polar sea, they hoped, but they would, f they would have you know, they would not suffer as they went. They had an unbelievable library. They had a lot of um, things to keep them occupied uh, during their voyage. They left in uh, the summer of uh, 1879 from San Francisco. 20,000 people were gathered uh, there to, to watch them leave and to, to wish them bon voyage. Uh, so it was, it was a national endeavor. It was a very big thing. All the papers covered it. Uh, they left, went north, headed towards Alaska um, with 33 men. 
uh, including um, two guys from uh, China who were Cantonese China, Chinese who were the cooks on the Jeanette. Uh, there were Scandinavians, Germans. Uh, uh, there were two Alaskan Inuits that they, they got in Alaska to be dog drivers and, uh, and hunters. So it's a very international cast of characters. They head north through the Bering Strait and the Chukchi Sea towards um, this place called Wrangell Island, which then was thought to be part of a, a transpolar continent. It was a mysterious land. No one had ever landed on it. And they wanted to explore that in, in, in route to the North Pole. Unfortunately, very quickly, they became locked in ice. And um, they stayed locked in ice, not for two weeks, not for two months, but for two years, drifting about 1,000 miles towards the northwest, generally in the direction of the North Pole, but um, not, quite, uh, not quite reaching it. During these two years, uh, they, they went nearly mad from, from boredom and, and togetherness, but they, they really didn't suffer particularly. Um, except that uh, there was one guy, a meteorologist on board, um, who uh, was from Ireland. And unfortunately, he had a penchant for puns. Uh, he, he would not stop with the puns. And this went on for the whole two-year period and to the point where just about everyone on the ship wanted to kill the guy. This is Collins. Um, another gentleman, uh, this guy, um, Dannenhauer, who was the navigator, um, turned out he had syphilis uh, and developed a condition called syphilitic iritis where he uh, had to undergo multiple, like dozens and dozens of operations on his eye uh, to keep from going completely blind. Uh, operations that the surgeon, uh, you know, he had no anesthesia for it. He didn't really know what he was doing. He, he was just a general surgeon. Um, so apart from the punster and uh, this guy and his travails. It was generally um, a two-year period of waiting and, um, and getting out on the ice every day to exercise and, and to um, take measurements of everything. They measured everything in, in, about the condition of the ice, the thickness of the ice. Uh, it was essentially a traveling weather station uh, locked in the ice pack. Um, George Washington DeLong's wife, Emma DeLong, um, was intimately involved in this expedition. She didn't go on it, but she sailed with him around the Horn to San Francisco uh, and uh, followed every detail of its preparations. Uh, I show this picture mainly because I had this experience early on in the research for this book. It's kind of a experience that historians dream about, which is, uh, and it's, it's never happened to me before, which is this notion of, uh, you know, you find somebody through the phone book and you, call them up and you find out they're a relative, this was a, a relative of George DeLong, a uh, little old lady named Catherine DeLong, wonderful woman, who said she had a trunk in the attic full of letters and she didn't know what to do with them and she was thinking she might have to throw them away. Would I, would I please come and take them off her hands? And uh, you know, would I ever? Uh, I, flew to, I flew to Connecticut, um, looked, looked it over and it turned out to be the personal papers of Emma DeLong. <laughs> and including her letters that she wrote to her husband uh, for, uh, during this time. Each summer, she wrote these letters. She called them her letters to nowhere. And she had them sent to the Arctic via uh, Arctic whaling vessels. And um, I'm going to read one of these letters, just give, give you a sense of them and sort of the flavor of them. But these letters become a big part of the book. Um, as the story unfolds and the expedition goes from bad um, to worse. One thing you find uh, is with, whenever you're dealing with letters from the 1800s is that people just generally knew how to write a lot better than they do today. And, and it can be quite beautiful, they can be quite funny. Uh, quite thoughtful, and uh, this is just one little snippet of, of hundreds of letters that I had to work with. My darling husband, I have to keep a brave and hopeful appearance to those around me. I cannot worry them with my troubles. 
by this point, uh, they've been gone nearly two years, and she's starting to genuinely worry, you know, where is he, what's happened. Uh, they have a daughter, Syl Sylvie, who's at this point, I think, three years, maybe four years old. Um, so she says, I cannot worry them with my troubles. To Sylvie, I want to be cheerful. She cannot understand the situation, and I do not want her to. I do not think I really knew how dearly and deeply I love you, and I cannot understand how it is that I am, un that I am willing to make such unladylike declarations now, for you know my characteristic reserve. But I know you are longing for love and affection as much as I am. It is evening now. I am writing in the library. Little Sylvie is in bed, fast asleep, having said her prayers for her father's health and safety. There is a blazing fire in the grate. The two dogs are stretched out on the fur rug in front of it. How would you like to spend the evening with me? Or is it pleasanter where you are? I suppose I mustn't tease you, not until we meet and I can judge how much teasing you can stand. Emma. So yeah, that's the kind of stuff that came out of her papers and the idea that I uh, the bargain that I made with uh, Catherine DeLong was that after I was done with this book that they would all end up at the uh, Naval Academy um, Museum and Archive. Um, so I, I think that was ended up being a, a very smart bargain and, and, and just it becomes the emotional spine of this book. When I do these stories, uh, when I do these books I like to travel as much as I possibly can to the places I'm writing about and so in this case I needed to go to Russia because that's where uh, most of this story takes place, in the high Arctic north of Siberia and uh, on the mainland of Siberia. Uh, so I got myself a, a kind of an Arctic haircut and uh, <laughs> uh, thought at first that there was some way I could go west from San Francisco to the Bering Strait via Alaska, but there were so many permits that I had to get to go to these restricted areas that I realized I had to go east all the way across the world to Moscow and then finally, after I got the permits to go uh, eight, nine time zones east to the uh, Pacific coast uh, of Siberia, to this place, Anadir, where I uh, managed to pick up a, um, a Russian icebreaker um, that was heading north uh, towards the Bering Strait and Wrangel Island with a, with a group of folks. There, were, there, were, uh, there was a French documentary crew, there, there was some scientists and, and some eco-tourists, a lot of birders it turned out, like intense birders. Uh, <laughs> I, I, was, I was absolutely surrounded by birders. Um, this is the easternmost uh, tip of the uh, Eurasian um, continent, a place called Cape Dejnev. Uh We went north uh, and past this island um, called Ulen. See if I can get some sound on that. Um, yeah, that that um, that village was um, it's a place called Ulen uh, that's very very difficult to get to. Um, they didn't really want us there. the uh, The villagers were fine with it, but there were soldiers there with with machine guns who said. You know, they really didn't want us to be there. They, they let us stay about an hour and they sent us on our way. But they had just killed a whale and they were having a, a festival and they were having high times there in, in Uelan. It was a really interesting stop, but uh, we were shooed away very quickly. We started heading north towards Wrangell Island and we began to encounter a, a fair amount of ice. Um, and it turned out to be, although there's been almost no ice many se se much of the time, many seasons. This particular year, which was the summer of 2012, um, there was a record amount of ice in that little part of the Arctic. So we get into it a little thicker, a little bit, of, a little bit thicker, and then we began to be glad that it was indeed a Russian icebreaker uh, because the, the ship began to shake and shudder and uh, uh, we were actually brought to a standstill several times. And this is in August. So you know, getting a little feel for what DeLong was, was going through uh, about, this about this place and about this time when he got stuck in the ice. This is a shot here that's 
looking straight down from the bow, and it's taken just with an iPhone, but um, it gives you some idea. Okay, so eventually we did get through the ice and got to Wrangell Island, uh, which is a substantial island. It's about 100 miles long. It's uh, been called the Galapagos of the, the high north. It's uh, the, the denning ground for, the largest denning ground for polar bear. It has a huge snow goose population, snowy owl, arctic fox, muskox. And it uh, seems to be a place that animals uh, do quite well, but, uh, but humans do not. Um, we finally did get uh, close, close to the shore and we had to come ashore by, by these zodiac rafts. It came up first to these cliffs where there were just thousands and thousands and thousands of birds. And this is when I realized I was completely surrounded by uh, bird experts. Um, uh, but, you know, fascinating. I mean, th these are, some of these are very rare species. Uh, others are just very common only in the Arctic. Um, but we finally did get on onto the island of Wrangell, and I think there's two or three reserve, um, Russian reserve um, specialists there who live year-round, and that is it. Otherwise, it's uninhabited. And um, I went there with a, a photographer from National Geographic named Sergei Gorshkov. Uh, we were doing a story for the magazine about Wrangell Island, which ran uh, last year. I think it was the March issue of uh, National Geographic. And he's been going to Wrangell for decades now, taking pictures of wildlife. And one of the things that's been happening is that because the ice has been so unreliable and uh, so thin, the polar bears have increasingly been congregating uh, on the island in large numbers. And this is not something that they ordinarily do. They tend to spread out on the ice and hunt seal and, and in ones and twos. But here is a picture that... Uh, it, it, sometimes he, he's seen as many as 30 all congregated in one place. They're eating a walrus here. It's an amazing place, Wrangell, and uh, it was first landed upon uh, by Americans, and because of this it's somewhat contested, it's somewhat controversial. Um, the Russians have claimed it. Uh, we did not do much to press our claim to Wrangell Island, but because we raised a flag over it first and claimed it uh, back in the 1880s, uh, there's, there's a sense in which we should uh, seize it back from the Russians. This, this ran in National Geographic. You may remember this picture. It's, uh, it's won a bunch of awards and stuff. The, the foxes really love the eggs, and they fight uh, with the geese over them. And sometimes the geese win, sometimes the foxes win. Also good facial hair. <laughs> I don't know why, but this, this picture, I just love it. It's, it just makes me smile. Um, they're about to start uh, bashing each other in the head. They, they, call, them, they call them tournaments, uh, like jousting tournaments or something from the medieval period. Um, so there's just a few structures on Wrangell Island, and uh, they all have to have these things. These, these are bear guards. Um, Six-inch nails, grates over every window. Uh, and this is Sergei's cabin where he was staying and, and where I stayed with him. Wrangell Island is also uh, the last place on Earth where woolly mammoths lived. And uh, they, they survived several thousand years later than anywhere else that we know of on the mainland. Um, and consequently, you, you find uh, tusks all over the island. And uh, we found this just it's lying in a riverbed. Sergei snapped this picture. I tried to fit it in my overnight bag, but um, it wouldn't fit. Uh, it's just elephant tusks, elephant ivory everywhere. Um, so it's, it's kind of an amazing little, little backstory. And there's a lot of scientists who go there to study this uh, phenomenon or what, you know, the sense that there was this. Um, kind of a subspecies, they were a dwarf subspecies of um, ma a mammoth that lived on the island. Okay, so that's Wrangell. Um, in uh, the summer of 1881, when the Jeanette had been gone for two years, 
about the time that Emma wrote that letter to her husband, uh, several more vessels were sent north into the Arctic to try to find the Jeanette. This, is always, this always happens. One vessel gets into trouble, and they send more after them, and they get into trouble. Um, one of the ships that was sent from San Francisco was the Corwin, which was um, sent north to look for the Jeanette and, um, and also to look for um, some lost whalers that had, had not come back the previous season. On board, the uh, Corwin was this guy. Um, this is the young uh, naturalist, conservationist, um, one of the fathers of the environmental movement, John Muir, who at that time was a newspaper reporter in San Francisco. He got on board the Cor Corwin and he, uh, he wrote beautifully about this uh, journey north to, uh, to find the Jeanette. And it was published posthumously as a book called The Cruise of the Corwin. So John Muir becomes one of the big characters of the last third of, of the book um, in this, this section that really is where people are trying to figure out where is the Jeanette, what is happening with it, um, and it's a big detective story. So where is the Jeanette? Uh, at this point, the Jeanette is about 800 miles to the northwest, still locked in the ice, um, and um, it is starting to, to sink. The, the leaks are, are just too much. The pressure in the, in the ice pack is too great. And, and eventually, uh, it seems obvious that the ship is going to sink, so obvious that DeLong, in a very organized and a very thorough way, gets all the essential belongings out on the ice and organizes this in a kind of military fashion um, because it seems inevitable. One of the reasons that we're looking at engravings instead of photographs is that, unfortunately, all the uh, expedition photos went down with the ship. Uh, all, every one of them, there's hundreds and hundreds, hundreds of them that were taken. Um, so that's one of the reasons I'm convinced that we don't know about the Jeanette, is uh, there are no pictures of it to speak of. So we, ha we had to rely on artist uh, renderings. I'm going to read a quick passage from the book that describes what happens when the ship um, finally does go down. And that moment when the men begin to realize that they are SOL, uh, out on the ice, 33 men and their dogs, and they have to somehow make it uh, to shore. Captain DeLong lingered a few more moments in silence. The grisly concussions of dismemberment had quieted, leaving only the sound of inrushing water. DeLong waved his bearskin cap in sad salute and called out, goodbye, old ship. Then he jumped to the flow, issuing a stern command that no one else was to board her. By midnight, the Jeanette was heeled all the way over, like a mortally wounded animal lying on its side. Its lower yard arms rested on the ice, DeLong, seeing no point in staring at the ship's final agonies, ordered the men to turn in for the night. The Jeanette was almost gone. The tip of the smoke pipe was nearly awash. Still lying on her side, she gently swayed with the shifting of the ice. Every now and then a sigh or a groan issued from the innards of the ship, but the fight was over. At four o'clock, at the change of the watch, something remarkable happened. With a loud rattling of timbers and ironwork, the Jeanette suddenly sprang up again, like a marionette, floating upright for a few long moments. It was as though she had come back to life. But then she began to sag straight down into the water, gathering velocity as she dropped. The watchman called out, if you want to see the last of the Jeanette, there she goes. As the ship sank, the yard arms snapped upwards, parallel to the masts, resembling, as Melville put it, a great gaunt skeleton clapping its, clapping its hands above its head. Then, in a final whirl of water, the Jeanette plunged out of sight. Nothing remained, said Dannenhauer, of our old and good friend, the Jeanette, which for many months had endured the embrace of the Arctic monster. The men were now a thousand miles 
from the nearest land, the Arctic coast of central Siberia. Even if they could reach it, dragging all their stuff and their boats behind them, their destination was one of the most remote and unforgiving landscapes on the planet. Little was known of central Siberia's sparse settlements and its coastline and rivers were insufficiently mapped. Siberia was mainly known as the place where the Tsar banished criminals and political exiles forever. DeLong and his men understood the fragility of their predicament. Their only hope was a place with a reputation for hopelessness. Yet in back of the desolation and despair, the men also felt a kind of relief. Their long period of inaction, of waiting and wondering in hapless drift, of suffering the tedium of a monotone imprisonment was finally over. They knew what lay before them. They, they only had a few months to save themselves. They realized they were facing an epic struggle for survival, and yet they were anxious to get going. The night was still, and the pack eerily quiet, as though the ice were contentedly digesting the morsel it had eaten. The men stared out the hole where the Jeanette had been. Nothing was left of her but a wooden chest floating upside down in the water. Their ship's requiem was the melancholy howl of a single dog. So, so this begins this massive retreat across the ice, a thousand miles, trying to find open water, dragging these flimsy whale boats south. Um, one of the most harrowing, one of the most uh, uh, difficult um, survival stories that I've encountered. And uh, it took them 91 days to, to reach water, uh, going over the ice. You know, I think a lot of people think it's it's like a nice, smooth, uh, you know, ice rink or something. What's the big deal? But it's like this. It's, it's constantly up and down and up and down and pools of meltwater and lagoons that they fall into, pressure ridges. Uh, it's impossible terrain to get across. Along the way, they discover three islands, which um, are now known as the DeLong Islands. They, they are also part of Russia now. Um, they do eventually reach open water. Um, and everything is going quite well, except for the fact that the second day, they encounter a massive gale. And this gale separates the three boats. And so the story um, becomes really the story of the very different fates of these three boats as they try to make their landfall um, in Russia. This is the place where they are aiming for and, and where they eventually land. It's um, the delta of one of the world's largest rivers. It's the Lena River. And uh, it is an unusual river in the sense that it flows north and into, into the Arctic Ocean. And it forms, because of that, a barrier, an ice barrier to, to, the, to its own current. Uh, and it was in the fall that they were approaching this delta. And so this phenomenon was happening where the, the ice builds up, the water has nowhere to go, so it, it, it just, the water fans out in all directions in a, an exaggerated um, sense of the fantail that all deltas have. Um, it creates thousands and thousands of, of little back channels and oxbow lakes and um, uh, islands, and it's a labyrinth, and it's the worst possible place to imagine trying to make landfall and trying to find yourself. And uh, so, DeLong and his men become hopelessly lost in this, in this maze. I wanted to go to this place to see it uh, because as far as I knew, not many Americans, maybe no Americans, had been to the specific places in the Delta where um, DeLong and his men went. So I had to go to this place, which is called Tixi. It's a, um, a former military installation on the Arctic Ocean. Um, it was a place where intercontinental bombers uh, used to take off. So it was basically a place erected to annihilate um, the United States. Um, now it's com almost completely abandoned, and you kind of run into folks like these guys. Um, who knows what they're doing there? Uh, one guy's on the cell phone, and I'm not really sure, but mysterious folks in, in Tixi. The roads are bombed out. The, the, there's no amenities. It's uh, 
We're, we're way north of the Arctic Circle, and um, uh, it's, it's permafrost, and uh, it's, a pretty bleak, uh, it's a pretty bleak place. But I wanted to uh, somehow get into the delta, because it's a very hard place to get to. It's a restricted area. It's also quite dangerous. And uh, so I met these guys who run a riverboat company that goes in and uh, keeps the, the channels open and um, is contracted by the government to, to sort of maintain the river. Because there are two or three main channels of the river that uh, are very much like the Mississippi River, you know, because you've heard about all the resources coming out of the interior of Siberia, uh, you know, timber, coal, uh, petrochemicals. So there's these huge barges that come, you know, it's a, it's a huge river. It's a 3,000 mile long river. So they have to keep it open. Um, so uh, I got on this boat. I was um, for a small price of a couple of thousand dollars, a lot of vodka, and um, a lot of cigarettes. Uh, they let me come on board. And uh, I worked on the, on the boat and uh, became part of the crew. It was just, it was a terrific experience. Uh, and and uh, we went deeper and deeper into the delta. And this was one of the last settlements. It was a, in a partially abandoned weather station. From here on, we were in, uh, in pure wilderness um, for about a week, heading for a place in the distance um, that I had heard about and was rumored to exist, but uh, I, I wasn't sure. But one of these guys had heard of it as well. And he. Uh, he said he'd take me there. It's called America Mountain. In the middle of Siberia, in the middle of Russia, there's this place called America Mountain. And um, it's the place where the, the men of the Jeanette who died uh, were buried and where a monument was erected in, in 1882. So I went deeper and deeper into the delta. They say that in um, this part of Siberia, there, there are two seasons. There's winter, and then there's mosquito. Needless to say, we were there during Mosquito. It was, it's very much like parts of Alaska. It's uh, the permafrost uh, melts the first couple of feet and becomes endless bogs. And, and the mosquitoes seem like they're making up for, for lost time. And, and uh, uh, it's bad. But we kept going. We got there. We finally reached this place, America Mountain, and headed up to this place. It took, this is a photo taken at about 2 AM. Uh, it's not. It's not dark. It, it won't get dark until for another month or so. Uh, finally reached the top, and uh, this is my guide. Um, <laughs> he's a Russian soldier, um, and uh, this is the Jeanette Memorial. Um, and at the bottom of that obelisk there, this is a picture of me at it. There's a little box, um, and I, when I opened it up, there was all these relics and sort of trinkets that had been left for for the men of the Jeanette, uh, money, little bottles of vodka, and lots of little messages that people had left. Uh, Russians, Germans, uh, some Japanese scientists, uh, but no Americans. As far as I could tell, no Americans had ever been here before. Um, so I left my little um, message to uh, DeLong and his men um, and uh, paid my respects. We were there for two or three hours. We had a picnic up there, and we, we finally worked our way back to the, to the ship. But I um, just kind of wanted to show you that you know, this is kind of the ends of the earth. This is one of the most remote places that I've certainly been to. I did this for um, a magazine called Outside, which um, helped me get there, helped pay for it. And it ran in the last month's issue of Outside, kind of in the footsteps of the DeLong expedition. So that's the background on the story. Um, I think we have some time for some questions, and I'd really like to hear from you if, if you have any questions about, about this voyage, about DeLong, uh, about uh, this part of the Arctic. Um, so uh, fire away. How much time do we have, by the way? You know, Maybe 15 minutes or something like that? What were we thinking? OK, perfect. I would love to hear from you if you have any questions. Yes, right there. Hi there. Nuts and bolts kind of question about how do you organize all the material when you get it during your research? How do you actually organize it in order to get it together to write? Yeah. Well, I have to. Um, I have to write one story at a time. 
you know, I find one narrative line that's important, like in this case, let's say the Jeanette voyage itself. And I write that story beginning, middle, end. And that's sort of the A story. And then I'll say pick up the, the John Muir story, the story of the vessel searching for the Jeanette. And I'll write that one from the beginning to the end. And then let's say I'll pick up the story of, of Bennett in uh, the, the New York Herald. And I'll write that beginning to end. And um, that'll maybe be the C story. Uh, and then uh, once I've written all these narrative lines, that, that's sort of the fun part because then I kind of do the Edward Scissorhands thing, you know, and just chop it up and find the, the break points and, and splice it and try to make it work. And that's, it's like an enormous puzzle and, you know, it's, it's a whole lot of fun to do that. And I do have an outline that I'm working off of, but as I start doing that chopping up stuff, I find that my outline is, is only partially um, revealing to me, you know, that it, it's evolved, the story has changed, or I find a better way to organize it. Um, but that, that is how I structure the narrative. How I structure the research is mainly that I just think about that one narrative at a time and, and assemble all my material that's connected with that. If I had to think about all of it at one time, I would have vertigo, I would be exhausted, I would be you know, a nervous wreck probably because there's just too many details to keep track of. So that's the way I kind of focus it down on individual stories. And, um, and you know, I, I think that it's, uh, it's sort of a cinematic idea, I think. You know, you follow one story and then you splice it with, or intercut it with a second, third, maybe a fourth story and um, uh, layer these different narratives on top of each other. That's, that's the idea anyway. Yep. Well, I, I just, you know, got on the internet and uh, I'd heard from somebody that there were some DeLong relatives in Connecticut and so I just literally started cold calling all, every DeLong in Connecticut and there was maybe 10, there wasn't a huge number and um, this woman picked up, I was looking for someone named Thomas DeLong uh, and she said that he had passed away the year before. Uh, but that she was Catherine DeLong, may I help you? You know, it's as simple as that. And that's, that's the fun part, you know, the sleuthing, uh, just trying to, to find uh, anything because uh, I, I wasn't even sure what I was looking for other than I had to assume that some distant relatives of DeLong would have saved some papers or had something that I could, could look at. So um, I think I heard about Thomas DeLong from the Naval Academy uh, where I went and did some research at their uh, archive. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was, that was really, that was one of the best days of, of my research, though, when, when she told me about this, and, uh, and, and I went there and found this stuff. Yeah. Hey there. Um, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> um, it, it's interesting. I, I uh, you know, of course you can Google it if you want to. Um, but I, we made a determination as I was writing this story that, and, and certainly as we began to package the book and write the flap notes, you know, the, the, the flap copy, um, that it would be better not to say what happens. Uh, in this case, because the story is just obscure enough uh, that most people don't know. And it's more powerful and more meaningful and more beautiful and more haunting not to know. So. Um, just by the subtitle, you can probably tell that you know it's some bad things are going to happen, um, as always happens in these Arctic tales. Just about always, they go north and everything goes south, you know, and it's true. And in this in this case, um, just about everything you can imagine, except there is kind of the classic um, trifecta of of um, ills in the Arctic. You know, there's there's scurvy, um, cannibalism, and, and mutiny. And uh, this one did not suffer from in, any of those uh, because it was extremely well run and uh, ably held together by DeLong. And um, you know, it really is a story of great leadership and great uh, determination and comradeship and teamwork uh, as they struggle across the ice. And, and but for a few turns of bad luck, uh, I'm convinced they all would have made it uh, and they all would have been welcomed as heroes. Um, but. Um, I won't say exactly what happens. Some die, some live. Uh, it's easily Googleable that 13 make it home, 13 of the 33. So I'll leave it at that and uh, not give away any more for right now. But thanks for your question. Yes? What was the sequence of events? Did you go to Outside Magazine and say, I have this idea, and I want to give you the story? Do you have the idea of the book and say, 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I've been working for Outside for a long time. I was an editor there full time for five years. And um, so I knew, I knew from the minute I decided to do this book that I'd do something with Outside. This is right down their alley anyway, so it made perfect sense. But when I found out how expensive it was uh, to go to Siberia, how many permits you needed, and how complicated it was uh, logistically, uh, you know, that's when I knew I had to have as much help as I could. Um, both National Geographic and outside helped me a lot, just kind of figure that out. I had to have a translator and fixers and lots of vodka and um, uh, lots of, um, uh, of cigarettes, <laughs> cartons and cartons of cigarettes. It's currency in, in Siberia. Um, but uh, I wasn't sure how I'd break it, break it down. And uh, uh, you know, it turned out that actually with National Geographic, it was a, just a pure happenstance that they got these photos from Sergei uh, and they were so good, they decided to do a story on Wrangell Island. And for some weird reason, they called me. They didn't know at that time that I was writing a book on this. They, they called me and said, would you be interested in going to Wrangell Island? And I said, would I ever? You know, this, this is central to my story and to my book. And uh, you just saved me twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. You know, thank you. <laughs> uh, because the, the, getting on board that vessel was really expensive. So. Um, but magazine work, you know, I do it less and less. Is I mainly work on these books, but when it dovetails with the research that I'm doing um, for a book, uh, I'll, I'll do a magazine piece. So that's, that's how that kind of worked. Yeah, in the back there. Um, is there another tutorial of, the, um, of your journey other than the Rundle Island one, the rest of Siberia? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's a Rundle Another pictorial? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, I don't. Other than the Rundle Island. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in, in Outside Magazine. Uh, some of those pictures I showed of Tixi and, and of the Delta um, ran in this story that was in the July issue of Outside. You can get it online. It's, it's called Welcome to Tixi. <laughs> and um, it's, um, yeah, it's, it turned out to be a pretty long feature. And um, uh, yeah, you can, you can catch it online. So Outside Online. Um, yeah, how you doing? No, um, not exactly, but it comes up in journals and diaries and uh, I mean, you know, uh, obviously a lot of Arctic literature, um, but a lot of classical stuff, um, DeLong loved novels and I don't know, I'm, you know, it, they were very well circulated. Uh, everyone by, the, by two years, anyone who could read had read every one of those books practically. Uh, unfortunately, they all went down with the ship. Um, but here's the thing that's kind of interesting. Um, they were um, they were working the whole time doing taking all these measurements of of the weather and the ice and hourly measurements of salinity, specific gravity, temperature of the air, temperature of the water, wind direction, wind velocity, da 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 da, da. and uh, just meticulous logbooks that they kept every day, every hour. And I saw these logbooks in the National Archives, and they're really big and heavy, and, and some of them are folio-sized, and you wonder how in the heck did they drag them all the way across the ice into open water, in those rickety boats, get ashore somehow, and, um, and they, they were actually buried uh, at one point in the sand uh, of, the, of the delta, and uh, two years later, and some Navy rescuers just happened to find them, dug them up, they were sent by dog team and horse team and reindeer team uh, to the railhead in Irkutsk, two or three thousand miles away. Finally, by tr by train all the way to Moscow and St. Petersburg, and they ended up in the National Archives. And when I was looking at them, I thought, God, you know, it's such a shame they did all this unbelievably hard work, and it probably is useless. It's probably not going to do anyone any good. But then I found out uh, just a few months ago that NOAA. Uh, in, in association with the National Archives and an uh, international group that's called Old Weather, um, have taken DeLong's journals and all these weather books and digitized them and are studying them now. Um, because one of the problems about climate research is that you just, they never know what did the ice look like 100 years ago. How thick was it? What was the condition of the ice? What were the temperatures? Uh, it's all kind of speculation. Um, You'd have to be, you'd have to like create a time machine, go back in time, 
lock yourself in the ice for two years and drift for a thousand miles and uh, create a weather station, which is, of course, exactly what they did. So now they're studying this stuff. I wrote a piece for the Wall Street Journal about this. Um, the Jeanette is proving to be a treasure trove of information about the condition of the ice 100 years ago, and uh, especially in that part of the Arctic. Um, and um, so I, I started to realize, well, gosh, you know, all this hard work paid off, and is it actually going to be useful to science in a direct way? So it's, that's kind of a, a neat little sort of addendum to the Jeanette voyage. Um, let's have one or two more, and then uh, I think I'm going to sign some books and like to meet you guys uh, in person. Hi there. Um, none of the men on this voyage died of lead poisoning, but they did get lead poisoning from uh, tomato, canned tomatoes, uh, lead that was used to solder these tin cans. Um, they figured it out. The surgeon was quite smart, and he figured it out, and um, um, they stopped eating <laughs> the, the source of the problem, but um, they, they suffered for months, and you know, some of them nearly died. Uh, it took them a while to figure it out. There, there are other Arctic expeditions where that was this, a main source of death, and like I, I think it was, um, I think they thought that it, the Franklin expedition, it, it must have figured into the early days of the Franklin expedition. But um, yeah, it, it's certainly a problem in the Arctic. It's like they were eating the tomatoes because they were thought to be helpful to, in terms of scurvy, uh, but you know that which helps you. Uh, for one thing, can kill you for something else. So that was one of the problems they had to, had to deal with. So thank you for listening tonight. I hope to meet you up front, and uh, we're going to sell some books. And, and very, thank you very, very much. <laughs>